So I finally got a Gerald Gente design watch. No, no, not, not the Royal Oak, or the Nautilus, or the Ingenieur. Hi everyone and welcome to Shaluso. And of course today I'm going to be talking about my own Gerald Gente design watch, the one that no one ever seems to remember or talk about, and that is the Cartier Pasha Sea Timer. Like all the classic Cartier watches, the Pasha starts with a story. It was 1932 and the wealthy Pasha of Marrakech found himself without a watch to go swimming with. So, like any nobleman of the early 20th century, he turned to Louis Cartier to build him a watch that he could take into the pool, as well as to formal functions. While the Pasha's original watch has been lost to history, in 1985 the concept was revived by none other than Royal Oak and Nautilus designer Gerald Genta. Genta's design brought out not only one of the first rounded watches to the modern Cartier collection, but it also featured Arabic 1930s style numerals, hinge lugs, and a screw down cover for the crown to give it 100 meters of water resistance. And that watch continued to evolve until the model we have here, the Cartier Pasha Sea Timer, a 40.5 millimeter ISO certified 100 meter dive watch with a unidirectional bezel, but still honoring all of Genta's original hallmarks, as well as the original concept of the Pasha's commission, a dress watch that could be just at home being sprayed with champagne or sprayed by the waves of the pool from a morning swim. One of the key requirements for a dress watch is that it's thin, and the Pasha doesn't disappoint. We live in a time of 15mm black bays and near 14mm aquateras. The 13mm of the Pasha is second only to Rolex for thinner dive watches, and those hinge lugs pivot right down for a snug fit for even smaller wrists. The classical design allows for the watch to pull off a dressy look without compromising its casual appeal, and the bracelet's H pattern links allow plenty of flexibility and comfort. The twin trigger clasp opens up freely without any need to force it open, and it reveals a surprisingly sturdy clasp considering this watch was originally launched in the early 2000s. And that clasp also features a curved underside so that it sits nicely when it's on. The links of the bracelet are all sized with screws, however the bracelet lacks any half links for precise sizing, so it may ride excessively loose or tight for those whose wrists don't fall right within the sizing margins. But overall it's a comfortable watch that will happily accompany its owners under the water, or under a shirt or jacket cuff. On the inside is an ETA 2892-82, one of the most popular off-the-shelf movements for higher-end watches, preferred over the 2824 due to its thinner profile and higher standard of decoration. The 2892 features hours, minutes, and seconds, a 42-hour power reserve, and a date that in this case has been shifted to the 430 position in an amazingly layered cutout, adding a bit of theater to what would have otherwise been a run-of-the-mill three-hander layout. Being an ISO certified dive watch, the Pasha features a unidirectional dive bezel that has a sublime feel to it. Enough resistance to know where it's going, but never so much that you need to put in effort to turn it. Part of the 100 meter water resistance is owed to the cabochon capped crown cover, an approach unique to the Pasha and how to circumvent the usual screw down crown. When you unscrew the cover, a smaller crown is revealed underneath, allowing you to wind the watch, quick set the date, and hack the seconds hand for precise time setting. Cartier may be a brand that prioritizes form over function, but the Pasha demonstrates that their function isn't an afterthought either. Much like their Florentine Richemont sister brand Panerai, Cartier benefits from having an additional cultural influence in their way to making watches beyond just the Swiss, and in this case it's the Parisian. The Genta designed Pasha oozes details that exemplify the French icon's traditional design, as well as featuring several touches that break with the tradition to create a truly unique piece. The white dial, railroad seconds track, and blue cabochon on the crown ensure that this watch is unmistakably a Cartier, but the Arabic numerals at 3, 6, 9, and 12 go against the customary Roman numerals, giving this a unique dial layout not found on most Cartiers. Then there's the layering to the dial. Cartier is known for its beautiful guilloche dials, but in this case they opted for a dial featuring no less than four different layers, including an elevated square seconds track, a nod to Cartier's usual square pieces all giving the Pasha a level of depth that will leave you looking at the dial for hours on end. The dial also changes with the light, being a flat white in direct light, 
but upon closer inspection, it can shimmer in silver or even glow in an off-white as warmer light hits it. Even the touches that give it more of a diver feel have been addressed. The knurling on the bezel and crown evoke a Clou de Paris style, and the chain holding the crown cover is beautifully polished in contrast to the satin finished case. Another nod to this watch's dress watch pretensions. The reality is that today a 100 meter diver isn't really considered a dive watch. It's what we've come to expect as a sports watch. But measured against a dress watch, as it was in the 30s when it was commissioned or even today, the Pasha becomes a beacon of versatility. A watch that has all the Parisian sophistication and elegance of a tank or a Santos, but with the go-anywhere appeal and reliability of a yachtmaster. Only the Pasha was reintroduced seven years before Rolex thought of bridging the gap between a dress and a dive watch. As a style icon and a luxury watch, the Pasha isn't just ahead of its time, it's truly timeless in its execution. So that's my impression of the Cartier Pasha. Now obviously this review is going to be a bit different because this is actually my own watch. I picked it up in Singapore in August 2019, so I've had it for about five months now. So I've had a lot more time to get used to it, get used to its nuances. I'm still of course going to outline positives and negatives despite it being my own watch. But the experience is obviously different versus, you know, a watch that I handle for a few hours or a few days versus one I've handled for months. But in any case, let's get right into the three positives and negatives of this watch. So the first thing I need to highlight about this watch is the dial detail. I love all the different layers on this watch. It has four layers by my count, so it just gives a lot of depth to the dial and a lot of excitement despite it still being a monochromatic dial with no subdials or anything like that. And just the little details that you see on the dial, despite it not having any coloration to it, things like the railroad seconds, which are of course a Cartier classic. It's one of the only classic Cartier touches they have on it but the nice shape of the rounded Arabic numerals. It's very sort of 1920s, 1930s. The way that they've executed the date at 430 as a little cut up corner of that raised plinth where you have the railroad seconds. And they've even given it some extra layering as well just to make it that little bit more interesting. And then you have the coloration of itself. I do say that it's monochromatic, but when you look at it closely, Depending on how the light hits it, it can be either full on white if you're getting a lot of light hitting it, but if there's softer light, it can be silver. In warmer light, it turns sort of an off-white. It's really something that's difficult to capture on camera, but it makes all the difference in the world when you have something that changes color with the light versus something that's just a flat color like on my Seamaster, for example, which is just an endless black. Another thing I love about it is it's a unique Cartier. So when Genta redesigned the Pasha in 1985, it was the first round Cartier in a very long time. You know, they didn't have the Calibre de Cartier or the Ronde or anything like that. You know, it was mostly tanks, Panthers, um, Santoses, all square or rectangular watches. Meanwhile, this was a round watch in that collection, but he didn't stop there. He added the hinge lugs, he changed the numbers, they're not Romans, instead they're Arabics, but they're stylized as well. He put that chain on the crown cover, it still has the cabochon, but it's that little bit of extra detail that makes it more fun and exciting. It really makes for an interesting watch and something different to, you know, the standard tank or Santos that you would normally associate with Cartier. And then the last thing I love about this watch is the story behind it. Cartier are masters of creating a story around a watch, Obviously, there may be some sensationalism and marketing going into them making this story. It's very difficult to come across any physical evidence of this watch that was designed for the Pasha of Marrakesh. But even then, they took the time to create that story, to push it, and it stays true to the concept of what they put behind that narrative. So as it goes, the Pasha of Marrakesh, he wanted a watch that he could go swimming with, but still take to formal occasions. So you shouldn't look at this as a Cartier dive watch. Instead, you should look at this as a more capable, more versatile dress watch. And that's exactly what I think this is. And it's something that I love about it is that because it's got that level of Cartier flair, you know, it's got that French style to it that some Swiss watches just really can't get close to. It's got a certain elegance to it. And it still has that dive bezel, which in my opinion is probably the most useful complication you can have because it's a really quick and easy reference as a chronograph. So just that entire story and concept. And then on top of that, there's the romance of knowing that Gerald Genta was involved in the design of this watch. This traces its roots directly back to that 1985 reissue of the Pasha. And you can see that 
Genta was trying to create something that wasn't his greatest hits. He didn't make it look like the Nautilus. He didn't make it look like the Royal Oak or the Ingenieur. There's no screws involved in the bezel or anything like that. It's not an integrated bracelet, but it's still an interesting bracelet. And that's something that I think Genta really sort of prided himself on was not only managing the integration, but just the harmony of a bracelet and a case, making that an interesting concept as opposed to just conventional lugs and a bracelet, lugs and a strap. And that for me is just one of the most interesting things about watches is the story behind them, the history behind them. So I love having this little piece of history on my wrist and having something that's a little bit off the beaten path. It's not the stereotypical Cartier, it's not the stereotypical Genta watch. And I absolutely love it for that. But that being said, there's still a few problems with this watch. And the first one is that it doesn't have any half links, which is extremely annoying when it comes to sizing. So I bought this watch near the end of summer in Singapore. So my wrist is expanded. And obviously when they were sizing it for me, I said, oh yeah, you know, make sure you put that extra link in there so that it didn't fit too tight because when I had it on without the extra link, it was extremely tight and I could barely get circulation to my hand. Now, however, I'm in India, it's winter, and this moves up and down all the time. It's really, really annoying. I'm pretty much waiting for summer so that I don't have to bother taking the link out because I know that as soon as summer hits, my wrist is gonna expand and I know how tight it is when I take that link out. So having a half link would have been ideal just to get that perfect and more precise sizing. And that's something that I really think even in the 2000s, they should have known better and should have been able to do. The second thing I dislike about this watch is yes, the hinge lugs look really cool, but also it impacts the versatility in the sense that while this is a great watch that you can easily wear as casual, you can wear it as a dress watch, you can go swimming with it. If you wanna make it more formal, you need to get either a custom strap or be ready to shell out quite a fair bit of money for an OEM Cartier strap. I've gone down the custom route, but it would have been a lot nicer if I could just order a strap online without having to recur to something that's an imitation because there's a lot of fake Cartier Pasha straps out there, but I don't really wanna put my money into that. So with those hinge lugs, and this is with any sort of proprietary lug system, it does make it a bit harder to play with the versatility and to switch it up and it can sometimes box you into only getting OEM or custom. So a bit of a disadvantage, but one that hopefully I'm gonna overcome soon. And then the last disadvantage to this watch is that while that crown cover idea looks really cool and it's a different approach to doing the conventional screw down crown, the crown on the inside is tiny. It's really, really hard when I pick up this watch after not wearing it for a while and need to wind it. Being able to wind such a small, small crown and it doesn't have a lot of feedback. It's very difficult to wind it and to know if you're winding it because the crown is so tiny. It would have been great if they gave it maybe a bit more distance at least from the case or you know if you could pull it out to the first position and that would be winding so that you could at least get a better grip on it and actually be able to know if you're winding the watch or whether you're just brushing the crown with your fingers. But overall these are all really small problems and also that hinge lug one, well that's kind of what I get for getting a watch with interesting lugs. But either way I absolutely love this watch. I've had it for five months and I still haven't gotten over it. I don't think I'm going to. And like I said before, it's great having a piece of Genta history without having to pay five figures. Speaking of that though, we have to talk of course about the price of the Pasha. The last recorded price I could find for it was in 2009 and that was 5,875 US dollars. But at the end of the day, what matters is what you pay today. And today you'll pay anywhere from about 2,500, 2,800 up to about 4,000 US dollars. So it's lost a bit of its value, but I think over time as people have realized how rare these watches are and how hard they are to come by, I think people are willing to pay a bit more for it. So it hasn't lost too much value over time. That being said though, it is still a Cartier with an ETA movement. It's not gonna be, you know, I wouldn't call this an investment watch by any stretch of the imagination. I bought mine for 2,800 US dollars in Singapore after I traded in my Tudor Black Bay. I probably didn't get the best deal because I probably didn't get as much as I could have for my Black Bay. But that being said, I still think it was good value for what I got. And more than anything, I was willing to pay that because it was so hard to find this. In a bit over a year of looking for it, it was only the second time I'd come across one. The first time was in Argentina. And even online, when you look, it's very difficult to find this reference. There's not a lot of examples out there. And this being my first pre-owned watch, I really, really wanted to find a great example that I really liked. 
So I was willing to pay that once I came across this particular one. And all things considered, it is a great watch because of how versatile it is. I never get tired of looking at it. Even throughout this video, just talking about those details, I keep wanting to look back at it. It's, it's something that I think every watch person should look into doing is getting watches that keep you excited. Getting watches not thinking about, oh, if I sell it, it'll be worth this or that, or oh, I want it to hold my money. Just get watches because you enjoy them. I originally discovered the Pasha when I was um, watching The Sopranos. Christopher Moltisanti wears an older version of it with the, uh, with the grills on it. And it just jumped out to me right away. And so finding the most modern iteration of it, obviously it would have been nice having a manufacturer movement, but being a Cartier from the 2000s, there was pretty much their MO was to get ETA movements and so was the case for most of the industry. But all in all, it's a great watch. I love it. It's something that I've already had a lot of great memories with and something I'm looking forward to in the future. But in any case, let me know in the comments below, what do you think of the Cartier Pasha? Do you like the idea of having something that's a little bit different to the normal Genta designs that everyone knows and loves? Or would you prefer having, you know, the classic Royal Oak, the Nautilus? Is it those or nothing for you? And also let me know what you think of Cartier as a brand, the Pasha as a model. I know its styling can be a bit divisive. There are some people I've come across that really love it. Other people that say it looks hideous and ridiculous because it's so different. But let me know in the comments below. And of course, if you like this video, please do like it and share it. Make sure you follow me on Instagram at Shaluso. And of course, if you want to keep watching new watch videos, make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. In any case, thanks for watching this video and we'll catch you on the next one.